just rip off of a um, quote from uh, some of the Discworld books. Uh, Terry Pratchett, the Tack is the god of the dwarves. Um, and you have in, in third, there's basically a section of religious text. Um, and the first thing Tack did, he wrote himself. Now, I attempt to explain why the hell I did that. Okay, so, um, there's a Python tool called Fab. Uh, website's fabfile.org. It's basically running commands on multiple machines, um, SSHing in, handling sort of connection management and stuff. Um, and somebody on Freenode Hash Perl was talking about using that for a bunch of sysadmin stuff, but then Perl for everything else. Um, and uh, okay, fab is actually quite simple. All it does is runs commands. So you have a local function to run a command locally and a remote function to run it on the other end. Uh, well, okay, that's kind of boring. Um, but a number of sysadmins have found it really useful. Um, the Django guys seem to use it for deployment a lot. So okay. That's reasonably interesting. Um, and then Tom Doran um, reminded me that I've forgotten about M Collective, uh, which is from the Puppet Guys, which is a message queue back system for running jobs on a bunch of um, machines. And it runs, well, okay, it has agent plugins that have a bit of Ruby code, but mostly it runs commands again. Uh, still boring. Uh, so I, I started thinking, what's the general concept behind this? Uh, well, messaging and jobs to run, okay? So, step back a moment from that and go, the actual thing is, run this on these machines. Alright. Uh, sort of semi-independent agent style almost. Uh, which is great. Um, so, we're now into, okay, what about running code on remote systems? Fab will just invoke a script that's already there. M Collective requires an agent installed. Um, okay, well, I, I want to be able to run random bits of Perl on six machines at once. Uh, but then you get into dependency management, which is always hilarious when you've got lots and lots of machines. Um, and when it's basically an ad hoc job. You don't want to have to package and ship a CPAN module to every single machine just to run a 30 second job that you're never going to call again. Uh, so, alright, Fatpacker can help with this. Um, because it will bundle everything up into a file, but you still have to pack each script. Um, and then you have to copy it across to all of the machines, and we're back to boring. Um, okay. So, Perl has this wonderful little feature where when it sees underscore end, it stops reading the file. It goes, this is end of code file. And in the normal case, it closes the file handle. Unless that file handle is stood in and you've invoked it as Perl dash. So, what you can do is SSH into the machine, start Perl dash, and then shove the script across the wire, send an end, and then you've got a normal environment <coughs> stood in and stood out a functioning file. Okay, cool. Uh, but then what? So, going back to Pratchett, the second thing Tack did, he wrote the laws. Uh, which I'm willfully misinterpreting as meaning I'm going to talk about the protocol now. So, object of the exercise, simple as possible. Um, human readable, because I want to be able to debug this on the wire using S-trace. Uh, all protocols should be debuggable on the wire by using S-trace. Um, and also, I want it to be already written, because I'm shading enough yaks already, right? <laughs> So the obvious answer when you need a protocol? <laughs> no. Not when basically, with the, the job is going to be like 20 bytes and I'm going to have 400 bytes of crap every, no. Um, so, okay, well, how, how, how are the best protocols done? Well, line based. Um, in fact, in terms of the paradigm, um, IMAP Red 4 is actually not far from what I want, but I'm not writing the parser. I, again, too much yak shaving. So let's use JSON. Because a JSON object doesn't have new lines in it unless you're pretty printed, at which point you can do one JSON object a line, you get a line based protocol, it's readable, I can actually type the protocol out into a console, and I didn't have to write any code. Great, okay. Um, <coughs> but we also, we also want to make sure that this stuff is reliable. If things go wrong, we need to collect the errors. 
So the messaging system needs three types. You have message, which is just a notification, don't care if it gets through, and request and response. Uh, yeah, that's not enough though. Because if it's a long running job, you need to be able to do keep alive pings and say this is where I'm up to. So a response is basically the progress all the way through and the final result. So four message types. So far that has been quite sufficient. Um, now, I agonize, I've spent hours going, do I put the request at the protocol level or <laughs> do I basically have each individual service handle that? Um, the eventual answer is it has to be at the protocol level because they always need to complete. So if you're sending a request to a remote system, the local system needs to know it's a request, so if it's lost its connection or something, it can send an error response. And so you can implement timeouts, and so you can track what's going on properly. Um, so I, I just was then thinking, okay, so now, now we have to figure out message routing. Um, traditional approach with sort of event-driven systems is you'll have one central registry, so PO has named sessions, um, other things have other things. I've mostly written things of that scale in pose, so I don't know. Um, but it, it struck me that the central dictionary idea was kind of, now, now I have a global. Uh, global's always irritable. Um, so I thought, well, why can't we do opaque routing? Um, so you have, it's just a bunch of strings. So each stage of the router just takes one string off the front. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we have that as a service name, and the router can just keep a hash. Literally, you just take the first thing off the front, and it's not quite as elegant as it might be. Um, it, it's, it's at this point that I was thinking, why does Perl not have car and CDR, and started thinking about whether we could do a list value and excess, and um, then reminded myself that I was already four yaks deep and moved on. Um, but. But, um, okay, but at that point something has to get there. So what you have is each router when it's first created um, instantiates a meta service. So you can then send a request to the meta service saying under this service name register an instance of this class to handle uh, messages going to it. So, alright, that's, that, that's some sort of messaging infrastructure. You, you, you're going to need a client to this. So given a lot of the time we're looking at doing scripting stuff. It doesn't actually matter if each individual thing blocks. So you basically have a single method do that will send the request, wait for the response, return a success result, or throw an exception if you get a failure. Um, <coughs> if you want a bit more control, then provide access to the result object, uh, which has a get method to get the data, and um, will we'll throw if there is one, so you check it for success first and pull the exception out. And if you're actually trying to do things asynchronously, then also provide a start method that allows you to register callbacks for progress reports and the final result. Okay? And then finally, if, you're, if you've then got that, you need some way of saying pause processing until these are done. So we have an await all method that literally just spins the um, socket processing um, until a result has come back for all of those requests. Great. Um, that's a conceptual model. We shall now have a small diversion um, into MSD hates event loops. Because um, of course, when, when you've only got one socket, that works really nicely. Then you have more than one. You go, okay, we, so we, we actually need to be able to read these things in parallel, can't block forever. <laughs> All right. Well, there's um, two extremely good solutions and <laughs> one piece of dick waving by a mad German. Yep. <laughs> um, but that, 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 that was kind of only the, these are all more than I needed. Um, more code in two cases, more headaches in the third. Um, so I, I thought, well, maybe, maybe you know, any event is the smallest thing. Maybe I could steal like 40 lines from the um, internals. Because, um, you know, it's per license, so is what I'm writing, that's all going to be fine. So I crack open any event in per. And it uses select, which is what I was expecting. 
Um, of course, select returns a vector of, um, with bit set to indicate which file handles are readable and writable. <laughs> so obviously what you're going to do is you're going to call vec on it to, uh, uh, no. Yeah. Mark Lehman has happened. What he does is, <laughs> unpacks it into a string containing 11010101. Then, <laughs> runs a regex against it to, get the, to, to uh, find the want. And now, where is which file descriptor you want? It's in pause. <laughs> <laughs> I've done that as well. Because <laughs> you're micro optimizing, it is actually fastest for a sparse <laughs> set. <laughs> I'm not saying it's clean, I'm saying it's micro-optimizing. <laughs> so I was forced to seek an alternative solution. <laughs> For reference, um, IO select is also hilarious, but um, it's much more controllable hilarious. <laughs> anyway, so um, the, the script for handling this um, is just called TAC. So that, as is traditional, loads app TAC. Um, app TAC just does initial option parsing and creates an instance of TAC script. Uh, but you want, to, you want custom commands, you want to be able to have a file that's got commands for this project to work. <coughs> so in, what we actually do is instantiate an object of class hack my script, which is an empty subclass, and then it requires in a file called tack file, which can in, inject whatever methods it wants into that, um, and then that provides your local commands. One could argue that I should use a Jensen package name in case there's more than one in the same script, but the kind of point of this is it's instantiated by the calling script. So I, I, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Famous last words, of course, but I, we can always change it later. Um, so you supply a list of hosts and the command name that you want to run. And now it needs to figure out uh, what handles the command. So the way this works is if you supply a method called each underscore and then whatever the name of the command is, that gets called for each host. <coughs> So, all right, what's dollar remote? Uh, dollar remote is, a connect, is um, provided by TAP connector service. What connector service does is uses NetOpen SSH, lovely piece of kit, simple wrap around the SSH binary. Probably not going to work on Windows, but we'll deal with running in hell when we get there. <laughs> <laughs> That's the name of the post source constant for Win32. <laughs> <laughs> to make me happy. Um, and you can just do an open to using um, that open SSH and get Perl on the other side. And then grab the script, send that across. Uh, so, okay, where does the script come from? The script comes from Fatpacker. So, Fatpack tree, find the patch lists for uh, the dependencies. <coughs> Algorithm C3, class C3, are not required on 510 but it's simpler just to pack them in so that you have one that works everywhere. I am faintly tempted to um, send across the wire initially um, a print dollar hat V and then pass the result to figure out whether I've got a new enough pearl on the other side, but it strikes me as unnecessary complication. I'm probably going to do it anyway now. Um, <laughs> and then fat pack file, which then puts all that together along with lib, which contains the tap code. Um, and then the actual code to run it is just load a class and tell it to run. Um, and that then sets up um, a router on the other side, at which point, once you've got a client to the remote, you can send a message that goes into the connector, looks up the remote host in the connector in another hash, sends it across the wire, and start loading services on the other side, which then gives you something to talk to. Okay. But we didn't fat pack that. We only fat packed the core of TAC. Ah. Uh, well, the far side has got a 
loop back router, basically an entry in its routing table called remote that sends back to the, to the machine that called it. So locally, we, we um, set up a module sender service, and then on the remote side, we fire up a module loader and tell it um, use exposed, um, which then passes to a reference um, to the router with the messaging. So basically, you stick those routes on the front, and it's going to come back to the module sender in our process um, on the host that we're running the um, tap script on. And don't need a global router, which is really nice um, because it means that we're not going to we're not going to accidentally tamper over anything. Um, so okay, the module sender. Um, service stuff uh, provides a method called handle something for whatever the type of request is. That's for synchronous handling. And all we basically do here is look up locally, can we find this module that it's asked for? If so, return the code. On the far side, in the module loader, um, we do the request back to the, ori back to the original host. If we get code back, open a string file handle to it, and then you shove the hook into our thing. <laughs> At which point, <laughs> you say to the far side, load this module, it goes, haven't got this module locally, got to the end of our ink, and sends you a call back over the socket saying, hi, having got this module, could you send it across, please? <laughs> At which point, anything pure Perl you've got installed locally is available to the code running on the remote host without having to install anything. Bonus points, by the way. Uh, you were talking about getting um, dull hat B. Yep. At the beginning. Um, you get a hash to config, so you know uh, what sort of access it needs. So you can send the correct access modules before the involves one on the other side. The config hash often isn't actually sufficient. Um, if you've got the arch name and stuff, yes, in theory, but the, you then get into the situation of you're still going to be screwed when you try and ship an XS module that's linked to a C library, but... Yes. Yes. You can play with the LDD to get the C library. <laughs> 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 it doesn't seem to work so well if you're running on this, this end in Solaris. Well, if you have Solaris library, uh, locally, you can simply send it to the solution. Yeah. We're both Should GCC over and build a whole new pearl? No, no, yeah. no. <laughs> That's a different distribution. I'm buying that one next week. They <laughs> <laughs> think I'm joking. Um, anyway. No, I don't. <laughs> uh, so, once you've got a service on the other side, you can send a request. So, the, the obvious simple one is I want to run a shell command on the other side. Um, so the command service basically just uses IPC system simple, um, pulls that out and stood out and ships that in the return code file. Uh, but that's, that's still um, <coughs> sequential because we're doing it each, each host on the way around. Um, well, well, come on. You, if, you, if you've already connected to 12 different hosts, you may as well run the command on them all at the same time. So you can also write methods called every underscore. That gets um, an array ref of remote objects, at which point you can start them all and then do an await, um, which means that you've got parallel execution, but you're still waiting for the results. So I also wanted to be able to do streaming. Um, especially, you know, if you're executing something like tail minus f some log file, it's not useful to only get the results when it exits. <laughs> <laughs> so we need to be able to do progress reporting. So start will take an on-progress callback that gets invoked. Um, but we want to make this optional. Um, so what we do is we stick a get up long spec in the prototype. Because I can. <laughs> Also because I didn't have anywhere else to put it, and these are all method calls, so prototypes are ignored anyway. Yeah. Um, having done that, if you actually get a hash ref of the options, pass through for you. Uh, and the point about this is, the, init, the options before the command name are handled by the main tap script, and then the options in the get up afterwards 
a pass for the GetOps spec for the action. So you can have completely separate namespaces, um, and in theory, could probably cascade action methods down with further get opting, but I've, I've not needed to go more than one layer deep so far. Um, so given the stream pipe S spec, you can also do minus S instead of dash dash stream. And that holds through for pretty much any option. Um, okay, but, okay, we, we want to run Perl code for a moment. And I don't want to have to write an entire service every time. Now, Okay, writing the services is useful when you want to be able to do complicated async stuff. But sometimes you're just going to want to load some code and run it. So we have tag object service, which does object remoting. Um, you pass a remote handle in, do new object to the class, and you get back a proxy object. Now, this is where it gets entertaining because the proxy object has to be correlated with the other side. Okay. So, um, JSON allows you to do convert blast, at which point when you encode the JSON, it will call the to JSON method on the object is applicable. <laughs> Great. But we're wanting to be able to handle arbitrary objects. That's okay. All we do is override the one in the universe. Now we can collapse any object. Um, and then you just de you basically encode it and decode it again. And you now have um, a data structure uh, where the objects have been converted. Um, to get them back out, you, are, you set up a single key filter, which means um, basically a hash ref in the JSON that just contains that key. The value gets passed through. And so the local proxies send method call requests to the remote service uh, with the appropriate object ID. And on the remote side, it basically pulls the uh, remote object, the object you've just called out of a hash locally, and calls the method on it. And the only thing that the proxy doesn't send through normally is its destroy method, which makes a call to the remote saying you can throw this object away now. Which point, you can quite happily construct an object of a random class on the far side and start calling methods on it. Um, which makes quite a few things quite a lot simpler. The only nasty bit of this is, um, if you can sort of look at this, um, absolute and stringify is actually going to be two full request response cycles because the code simply doesn't know that that's what it needs to do. Um, but it works fine. If I ever hit the point where I'm, do where, where I'm doing, making enough requests from that that I hit a performance problem, I think it's then time to bundle it up into a piece of code that runs on the other end. Um, the, the, the one thing that, that was still bugging me though was well, what if I'm, if I'm just experimenting? Um, you know, I have a, every time I run TAC, I have to set up an SSH connection, bootstrap the system on the other side, um, and you, you, you end up in, in the sort of cycle of run it, curse, <laughs> tweak it, run it, curse again. Um, and you know, given, given you're looking at maybe two or three seconds to start an SSH connection and ship the code out of the wire ship the code across the wire. Um, I mean, you know, the, the only way I, can, I could make the compiled debug cycle slower is loading Moose. Um, <laughs> so, okay, tiny wrap uh, which I believe I presented here somewhere. Um, tiny wrap is, tiny is a um, very simple interactive shell. Uses eval with lexicals. Eval with lexicals was written specifically to be pure Perl, which is why I do all sorts of strange things involving B in the source code. It's kind of fun, but no. Uh, anyway, pure Perl means it's fat packable, which means I can ship an e I can ship eval with lexicals over the wire, which means I can write an eval service. It means with a simple handler that pretty much just calls it um, and captures any output produced, um, I can write a tap REPL class and supply a host and get a pull REPL that's running on the other side. So, I'm going to see on this tomorrow. This is a threat. <laughs> 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 I don't make threats, this is more in the manner of a promise. <laughs> Or possibly you could uh, argue advance notice. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I am going to set up an IRC channel. I'm not sure where yet. I'm kind of tempted to stick it on Freenode because I want to try and get people using this who aren't just pull people. Um, and trying to get them to connect to IRC.pull.org is, well, you know, uh, that, that would involve them actually configuring their client and thinking. Um, <laughs> and also, they might join Ash Pearl. Um, <laughs> but um, once it ships out, have a play around with it, try and write commands with it, um, complain about the hopelessly inadequate documentation. I already know it's going to be hopelessly inadequate because I'm writing it. Um, yeah, I was thinking someone's job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and the same, well, it's not a job unless you get paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, 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 whole, the whole point of this thing is, it's something that you're right, that should be very quick and easy to write plugins for. So, basically, experiment. If you can't get something working in sort of ten minutes, um, I need to either fix the code or the documentation or both. Um, okay, possibly I need to fix the user, but that's. A, <laughs> <laughs> um, and to go for a final Pratchett quote, the third thing Tack did, he wrote the world. And I'd quite like to see people using this to write all sorts of things. And I've no idea exactly what you're going to want to do with it. Um, but I'm hoping there's, in the, that there's code there to support whatever it is. Thank you very much. Given I have magically not run over time, does anybody have any questions? Who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you uh, spot if you can't communicate, if you can't proxy your object? Do you see if it's inside out? Do you see if it's one of Stephen's new objects that apparently can't be followed up? Do you spot that? Well, it, it, it doesn't serialize it. <laughs> ah. The object lives on the remote side. Gets so it's a unique identifier. On the side and and the unique there. identifier is shipped across the wire. <laughs> Um, the only thing that shipped, the only things that are shipped across uh, verbatim are plain pill data. So it's not mirrored; it's just completely proxy. Yes. Um, what, what, what you have on the local side is um, basically practically just the ID blessed into a class with an auto. Sorry. Can you tell me my genders file, please? What the heck is that? Um, it's a file that explains facts about what's in your machine. Right. Um, so you say, always file responses, and my rate of all my things running related to type 6. You can then go and get those to the host and run the commands. Should be possible to have a small plugin that sits at the um, parsing level that will take any sort of filtering. So I get my genders file via a different number of those. Yeah, if you do, uh, if you wrap around the puppet generally, that will have a lot more updates. Lots of people run the puppet. Right, but M, M, M collecting is the puppet lab's yeah. official thing for doing. No, you can actually, um, um, puppet keeps, sorry, puppet keeps people running through the gamut stash of stuff. They don't have any right. They just pass that directly and keep on the gamut stash. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I, was, I was sort of planning to allow the cards to be put into the cards and stuff. Yeah, that's very easy. We'll figure out what we're going to do.